Okay, now it's time for here's Q&A number 41 or 2. I don't think it really matters. I don't number these anymore. Uh, for these videos, I basically just talk about stuff that's gone on in my life since the last time I made one of these, as well as answer questions from the last Q&A. And in the last Q&A, I decided to start up leveling a character while I do this. So let's see how that goes. Okay, so let's see. What do I have written down here? The last time I was doing this, I was doing quests and stuff. And it seems like I was able to do them kind of fine without too much effort because there's lots of just talking. I only have to like stop to read the questions a little bit. And then I mainly just ramble on about something stupid. And most of these quests are not very difficult. And Zygor kind of tells me what to do if they do require some actual thinking. So, let's see. What do I have written down here? Uh, it says Yu-Gi-Oh! Channel is doing well. BlizzCon, health-related problems. Azeroth Weather Channel. Uh, I wrote down the Yu-Gi-Oh! thing twice. Let's delete one of those. Okay. So, I guess I could say I'm going to BlizzCon this year. I have a ticket, and I have a hotel, and flight booked and everything. So it's all good to go, I guess. And that'll be like in two weeks. And I'm not... Like, on one hand, I am looking forward to it. It seems like it'll be a lot of fun. Especially since I get to meet a whole bunch of people. Like other YouTubers and friends who are going to be there. And I guess fans too. That's not like the main reason I'm going. I also thought like, what if I did a fan meetup and no one showed up? That would suck. I don't think that would happen. I'm pretty sure at least one or two people would. There's always that thing like, I, I have a big following, but my fans don't really like me that much when compared to other channels with similar numbers to mine. Considering the type of info the type of videos I make isn't very like personality based. I'm just giving facts and the facts are detached from the person itself. But at the same time, I'm not really worried that much. I'm just kind of using that as an excuse because I'm also just really lazy. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I also don't like to plan things. So that that's a problem for future Hiri to worry about. Current me doesn't really care. And because of that, like, I heard there's this thing called the con before the storm, which I had never heard about before. But apparently it's like this party where they have YouTubers and they have, like, official meetups and you can go and meet them and everything. And I was like, huh, never heard about this. Just found out about a couple of days ago. Like, uh, I told Hazel about it and she's like, you know, you can still probably apply to it now and that you'd even help me out. And get me in contact with someone and I was like nah I'm fine I don't really care I'll go meet you guys though but no thanks I don't want to uh, do that because I think I already have something planned on that Thursday anyway since the ticket I bought is like a charity event ticket and I think it's that Thursday night like I just found out that there's a whole bunch of parties I go on at BlizzCon hosted by a bunch of different websites like the Wowhead party and stuff and I never actually knew about any of these until I was watching the podcast by the Lost Codex. I was like, oh, these all sound fun. Even though I don't drink. But they just sound fun to go to. Since I'm all about experiencing different things now. Because before, past me just wanted to stay inside all day and play video games. He didn't really care about going out and doing things. I've kind of changed my mind on that a lot. I actually like to go outside now, mainly because I need to go outside more often because of my, uh, like I'm still recovering from overwork and general anxiety. And going out and doing things has helped a lot. That's why every Wednesday I go out to the store and just, just look around and like buy some Yu-Gi-Oh cards or something. And I'll probably end up just selling all the cards I've bought so far because I have too many of them now because I've been doing that for like a couple months now. Uh, anyways, what I did do though for BlizzCon is I bought these little buttons, which I printed the name, the little icon of my channel, the Haruma guy. 
use this at the top of the post. Oh, okay. I trust you, Zygor, to tell me where to go. I bought these little buttons, and I was just probably going to pin one to my shirt or my badge, or a combination of the two, because I bought five of them. That was like the minimum order you can get besides just one, because it was like $5 for one button or $6 for five buttons. And I was like, for one more dollar, I can get four more buttons? Yeah, might as well do that. So I have five, and I'll probably just have that. So if you're going to BlizzCon, that'll probably be the only way to know what I look if you found me or not, is I'll have one of those buttons on. And I'm pretty sure no one else will have a button because, I mean, who who the hell is going to have a stupid button of that terrible icon? So you just throw them from up here? Is this what you're supposed to do? Climb the tower, use your cursed ore to mark spots on the ground. It has oh, a 15 second cooldown. And it takes forever to actually activate. Okay, I'm gonna be here for a while. Okay. So I think that's enough about the BlizzCon talk. Uh, I'd rather just stay home and do nothing and just watch it online. But at the same time, you know, I've always wanted to go to one of them. And I have the means to go to one of them. So I might as well go. Better now than later. Because my life philosophy has always been, if you're going to do something, just do it. Don't wait forever. Don't wait for the perfect opportunity. Basically, do it as soon as you can. So that's what I'm doing. It's like, I can go to BlizzCon this year if I want. So I am. And that's all there is to it. But, I guess this goes on to the other thing. Uh, I do... I do have some, like, health problems that cropped up a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I don't know if I should talk about them though, not because, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to talk about them. I don't know if you guys want to hear about it, because they're kind of gross. <laughs> like, I wrote a thing on Twitter about it, and... Uh, I don't know. You know what? Rather than tell the story, because I know some people like to listen to these before they go to sleep or while they're playing other games, and they probably don't want to have to fast forward through me telling a really gross medical problem I had. So I'll just like put a post to the twit, the Twitter long thing I wrote about it, if you're really curious. And just summarize it without giving any details, like on a Sunday night, a couple of weeks ago, I started bleeding, and I had to go to the hospital to get the bleeding stopped. And I'm still recovering from the wound that caused the bleeding. But I should be fine now. I'm probably like 90% better. I'm still just kind of recovering because I do like a mini operation on me to get it to stop. And the problems with that were like twofold. Sure, one, you know, the whole medical problem that required me to go to the hospital in order to get bleeding to stop. But they were able to fix that pretty easily. They weren't concerned at all. Because apparently it's a pretty common thing and a very easy thing to fix. They performed the mini little operation basically on the table for just a regular waiting room. And I was like, that's pretty gross. <laughs> and also, like, this always happens to me. I didn't have health insurance at the time. But I did have health insurance the month before. Because, like, my health insurance uh, from my mom's work ran out when I turned 26. So I got my own health insurance. And the thing is, I didn't have the health insurance set up for the payments to actually go through. And I didn't know that, and I ignored their messages. Because they kept sending me invoices, and I just didn't read them. Because, you know, it's like, oh, I have it set up for automatic payments. And apparently I hadn't paid for two months. So they dropped my health insurance. And they will not reinstate it. Because health insurance is weird like that. You can only apply for like certain times of the day. You can't just buy health insurance whenever you want. And since they dropped me, I basically have to wait until the next reinst uh, thing when you can actually get it again. Or in case my appeal goes through and they let me buy the health insurance again. Whatever the case, I had to go to the emergency room without health insurance. And I was like, man, if this, if this costs too much money, I'm not, 
I'm just not gonna go to BlizzCon this year. It's like I'm only going, you know, just to because I've always wanted to go at least once. It's like might as well just do it as soon as possible rather than wait for the perfect time. I was like, so I'm not really going this year for any specific reason. I'm just going because I can. And if the medical bills are too much, you know, I'm just gonna call it off because going there is uh, quite the pretty penny. And since I actually had to go to the hospital two times because the bleeding, uh, it didn't stop right away, so I had to go back later on that day. So I had like two little, two little payments for it. And uh, I finally got the bill back, like a couple of week, a week or two ago, and the total was less than five thousand dollars, which is something I can pay. And I was like, okay. I was very concerned that it would cost, you know, tens of thousands of dollars or, you know, if I was super unlucky, over a hundred thousand dollars. It's like, that's, that's too much. It's like, if it's that much, then, you know, I'm, it's going to take a while to pay that off. <laughs> but then it was like 5,000. It's like, you know, that's, that's a lot, but I was expecting worst case scenario. And it's like, I can honestly afford this especially if I don't know I think they give you a discount if you pay it all off at once or I don't know I have to figure that out but you know I got the bill back and I can afford it so it's fine it, it would have been way cheaper if I had health insurance though but I don't and I did hesitate going to the hospital because I didn't have health insurance because I thought you know maybe the bleeding will just stop on its own but it didn't. Next to the smoldering brazier, so I have to come all the way over here. And it's, it's a good thing I bit the bullet and decided to go into the hospital anyway. Because the bleeding never would have stopped on its own, and that would have been bad if I had waited longer. But, short of the thing is, it's all good. I'm still recovering. But because I've been recovering, I haven't been going to the gym. And because I haven't gone to the gym in like three weeks, I'm out of shape. Uh, it takes, from what I remember from when I was in high school, the coaches would always say it takes two weeks to get in shape, and it only takes one week to get out of shape. And it's been three weeks, uh, so I'm definitely out of shape now. Which sucks, because I'm going to be going to a convention and walking around all day, and I want to go to as many of the parties as I can. And I was like, I don't know if my body will be able to actually do all that. Especially if I'm not in shape. And especially if, you know, I'm still not better. I can't start working out today either. I st I'm still recovering. I think it'll take, you know, at least a couple of months before I'm back to 100%. And so not only am I not in shape, but I'm also not even fully healthy yet. So it's like, ugh. How annoying. Of course this would happen right before, you know, BlizzCon. Why couldn't it have happened, like, you know, a couple of months ago or, you know, a month after? But, I mean, I guess it could have happened this week or something. At least I'll be somewhat recovered before I have to go. And my plan is basically, if I walk or stand up for too long, uh, I start getting in pain. So I'm just going to carry around some ibuprofen with me. I'll just do a little bit of light, light doping. <laughs> Just like I used to do in football, where I was constantly in pain, and I would just take like four ibuprofen before practice, and I'd be able to do it no problem. In this case, I'll just take like two of them. That way I just won't be in pain while I'm walking around all day. Easy stuff. But man, is that gonna be annoying. And I'm kind of hoping, you know, it doesn't get worse. Probably won't, but I still like to worry about stupid things like that in worst case scenario. Okay, so I haven't actually talked about any of the questions yet, and I'm probably not because I still have two more things to talk about. Let's see, besides BlizzCon and my health problems that are too gross to talk about, there's also the Azeroth Weather Channel. I guess I started it last time I did a Q&A. Last time I did a Q&A was like two months ago or something. Okay, I'm doing this one with headphones on. And that's kind of loud, so I'm going to turn this down a little bit. So the last Q&A was two months ago, mainly because people don't really like Q&As. 
Uh, every time I upload a new Q&A, I lose subscribers. So I'm trying to keep them to a minimum. There's only a very niche amount of people who actually watch these anyway. So that's why I'm trying... I'm not really trying to keep them under a time limit anymore. Because people who watch these only watch them while they play WoW or to fall asleep to. So it's like, I'll try to keep them under two hours at least. Because <laughs> I don't want to edit them. Uh, anyways, what about the Azeroth weather channel? I mean, it's doing as well as I thought it would. Like the channels on the main channel used to get 10,000 views a video, give or take, and which was really bad. And on their brand new channel with like 9,000 subscribers, they get about 5,000 views each, which is not half bad. That's about the retention rate I was expecting. Kind of hoping it would be more, but that is exactly what I was expecting. And I usually undershoot when I expect things. You know, that way I can be pleasantly surprised if they do better. So it's like, whatever. Uh, the people who do watch it seem to like it well enough. But, you know, there's a reason I had to move it to another channel. Because it wasn't doing that great in the first place anyway. And I don't have any plans on canceling it. Also, my Yu-Gi-Oh! channel. I don't remember what I said in the last Q&A about it. Uh, but I hired an editor to make the Yu-Gi-Oh! Top 10s. With those, basically, I write the script for it. And I tell him, like, where all the cards will appear in the list, because the editor doesn't play Yu-Gi-Oh! But he does a really good job with the edit anyway, because of the way I write the scripts. Like, if I talk about a card or, you know, mention one in passing, I'll put a link to the card in the script itself. And then he'll just put that on screen. Because part of the reason I have an editor for that is because finding high quality artwork for card images is very time consuming because a lot of them are really garbage quality. And also putting the video together, the visuals, is very time consuming. It's not hard, especially since I just tell him exactly what to put and where to put it, and then he just does everything else. Uh, it's easy work for me. I write the script. I have so much knowledge on Yu-Gi-Oh! because I've been playing it since the game came out in 2002. If there's anything I know more about than WoW, it's Yu-Gi-Oh! So writing the scripts is no problem at all. And I have like a million different ideas. And, you know, they're doing well too. So once I write the script, I also just record the audio. And then I send him the script and the audio and the deck list, which will have all the cards in it so he can have a visual of what to look up online to get the cards. And then he puts the video together, and then we release it. And the videos are doing... What did I write here? Uh, doing super well. The channel is doing amazing. Way better than I thought. I knew top 10s would do well. I wasn't expecting them to do this well, though. Like, every top 10 video is getting views on par with my WoW channel. Like, they usually get around 50,000 views each. Which is what I would think would be good for a WoW video. And then they just keep getting more and more. Some of them are over... I have a couple that are over 100,000 views. And that is so good. And like my most popular top 10 has almost 500,000 views, which is really good. Uh, the Yu-Gi-Oh! Top 10s are performing very well. To the point where, like, if my WoW channel died, like today, you know, all the videos got deleted, and I could never make a WoW video ever again, I could still do YouTube full time because of how well the WoW channel, the Yu-Gi-Oh! channel is doing. So good news on that front, especially since it doesn't take up too much of my time. I spend about two to four hours on a script, and that's like from start to finish. Starting the script to, you know, recording the audio and putting all the stuff together, putting the links in for the cards, and then sending it off to the editor. And then he puts everything else together. And considering how well the videos do, that is like, technically, you know, from the amount of time and effort that goes into it, those are my most successful videos. Which is good news. And it's so successful that I'm thinking about trying that with my WoW channel. Not my WoW channel. My Pet Battle channel as well. 
I want to see if I can replicate the success again. Make pet battle top tens or or not. I don't want to stretch myself too thin. But that is something I have been considering. Only if I can get the editing style done. Because part of the reason the Yu-Gi-Oh! videos, I'm able to make like two of them a week, give or take, is because on top of my time and effort that goes into them not really requiring too much time, they're also really easy to edit. Uh, a lot easier to edit than any of my WoW videos. So if I'm going to make Pet Battle ones too, I have to figure out an easier way to put them together. So I'm working on ways to put a Pet Battle Top 10 together the same way I do the Yu-Gi-Oh ones. And if I don't find anything, I'm not going to do it. I've canceled things in the past before because I just couldn't do them good enough. Okay, so enough about that. Now let's go on to the questions. There's actually uh, quite a bit of them. About 10 questions. Some of them are very long. <laughs> uh, let's see, I need to find trees for this quest. Let's make sure this thing is still recording. Okay, so question number one. Lots of talk about Sylvanas. Oh, okay. So in the last video, I talked about Sylvanas and her burning on the tree or whatever. So half the comments were about that. So I just put them all grouped up together and then I wrote down one person's comment about it because I think he made up a good point. So uh, people have to stop using Scorched Earth for an example of Teldrassil. It's not the same. It would be if maybe the Alliance burned down the tree to destroy a huge chunk of the Horde forces before they knew they were going to lose it. Regardless, but that's not what happened. Scorched Earth is when you lose your own resources to deny the enemy those resources when retreating. And that's true. I did use Scorch Earth policy when I was talking about why Sylvanas burned down the tree as like a tactical maneuver. And that's not the right word for it. Uh, that was just my mix up. But in my defense, my intentions with that is that I'm just recording a Q&A video and I'm not doing like research on this. So I just chose the first thing at the top of my head and it turned out to be wrong. So that's it. I make mistakes. And I'll admit at such when people point them out to me. So what really happened with Sylvanas is something else. I didn't actually look it up. Uh, she burned the tree down. And you know what? Whatever. Uh, let's see. Well, not whatever. I'm pretty sure there's something else, but, you know, I'm not going to try to pretend like I'm some kind of military genius and be like, ooh, these are the tactics she used. Uh, because really, it was effective at pissing off the Alliance <laughs> and denying them of, like, a, a base on Kalimdor to attack them. There was some merit to it, but it wasn't Scorched Earth policy. That's something else. Unless you want to do mental gymnastics to try to you know, try to fit in, you know, maybe it is Scorched Earth policy because technically they did own it and then they destroyed it so the Alliance couldn't take it back. It's like, oh, I don't know, maybe. I'm not going to try to fit my narrative though onto things where it doesn't really fit though. I'd rather just admit when I was wrong about something and move on. Let's see. Next one. After everything Sylvanas has done recently, do you consider yourself as a Sylvanas supporter, or are you all in for Thrall's Horde and the way they do things? Some details on the different point of views would be great. Funny enough, I actually wrote a script about this. A script I'm not going to make into a video, because someone else made it. And they covered a lot of the same topics I did in the script, but I don't really agree with the outcome they had. The script was basically... Do I have it open right now? No, that's something else. I I might have forgotten what I called the video. Let me look it up real quick. Okay, the video is called The Problem with Sourfang. And this kind of goes into your question about do you believe in Thrall's Horde? No, not really. Mm. And that's the problem with Sourfang, is that Blizzard is trying to paint the narrative that Sourfang's ideology is the correct one and what Sylvanas is doing is incorrect, which I fundamentally don't agree with, 
But I also don't think one or either side is totally right or wrong. I don't think what Sylvanas is doing is 100% correct. And I don't think what Sourfang is doing is 100% correct. And I think there's like shades of uh, dare to bring up the meme, but shades of grade in there. And basically, uh, the video I have in question details Sylvanas' victories because she was actually one of the most successful generals in Warcraft of you know of the people who are alive in Warcraft right now. Uh, if you watch the Vari Mothris video, the var video on the villain's corner on Vari Mothris, it details how Sylvanas built her army in the first place. Like, she was a banshee, and she had like her little group of banshees with her, and that was it. And after they failed in taking out Arthas, they were basically on their own, and they had all the other dreadlords around who wanted to absorb their faction and take over all of the Forsaken. And Sylvanas was like, no, I'm never going to be under someone else's control again. And she defeated all of the dreadlords who were in charge of the area and the Scourge one by one and took over Lordaeron and even took out all the humans in Garethos. Like she built a kingdom out of a small group of banshees and it was in a very ingenious way. And then she successfully took over Gilneas. And she successfully took Teldrassil, a thing that even Garrosh failed at like an Ashen Vale. Garrosh wanted at Teldrassil as well, but he was never able to take it. And then she totally would have won in the Battle of Lordaeron if Jaina didn't come in and, what is it, do sex machinima, machima, I can't say that word. I keep saying it like machinima. If Jaina didn't come in and save the day. Because, like, the Blight of the Gates, uh, Alliance didn't have a countermeasure for that. The Blight inside the city, you know, that totally screwed them over. And then, you know, the Blight by locking everyone into the throne room, that would have killed the leader of the Alliance. But Jaina was able to freeze the Blight temporarily so that they could go on top of it, and she was able to teleport him out of the throne room when Sylvanas trapped him there. So Jaina single-handedly saved their asses from not dying, but technically Sylvanas won the battle, you know, by just destroying her own city, and I think that would be Scorched Earth policy. She denied her opponents the victory. Oh, that's not really a victory, because a victory would be her, you know, pushing them back and still holding Lordaeron, which she didn't do. Hmm. At best, you could say that she denied them, but that's fine. She doesn't need everything. She did take Gildneas, even if she also blighted that, too. <laughs> she really needs to stop doing that. <laughs> uh, and also, there's the fact that the Alliance aren't exactly clean a fault either. When the Forsaken first had their kingdom, Sylvanas sent emissaries to the Alliance, you know, to try to reforge their alliances, because he's like, everyone who was a Forsaken was part of the Alliance at some point, including the High Elves and all the humans of Lordaeron. And instead of talking to them, all of the emissaries were killed. They didn't even try to associate with the Forsaken or try to negotiate. It was kill on sight. And not only that, they actively started hunting them down. Like the members of the Silver Hand uh, just started killing all the Forsaken they could see, whether they were Scourge or not. And those members of the Silver Hand who did that eventually turned into the Scarlet Crusade. And it's like, you know what, you can't blame the Alliance for the actions of the Scarlet Crusade until you remember that the Alliance didn't actually you know, distance themselves from the Scarlet Crusade until BC. In Vanilla WoW, you know, they weren't exactly openly endorsing the Scarlet Crusade, but they did have envoys of the Scarlet Crusade in Stormwind. And they did offer them aid occasionally. So, the Alliance have a history of just screwing over the Forsaken. And in real world terms, there are still some countries like today that hold grudges over things that other countries have done to them like hundreds of years ago 
And the fact that the Alliance were actively hunting down the Forsaken, you know, not even less than a decade ago, it's just not something you forget so easily. And then you also have the Blood Elves. When the Blood Elves tried to rejoin the Alliance, uh, they would send them out on suicide missions. And then when they accepted help from the Naga, they sentenced them all to be executed. So the Blood Elves had no choice but to join up with Illidan. And then when that didn't work out, Lorthamar had to uh, ally himself with the Horde because he didn't really have a choice. Uh, and uh, Sylvanas was very nice and reached out to them for that. And they were able to find Kel'thas because that was one of their main reasons for joining the Horde. It's because they lost contact with Kel'thas. Not the only reason. But that was one of their main motivators. So after they had all that figured out, you know, and Garrosh was being a jerk to them, they did try to renegotiate with the Alliance, even though the Alliance were a bunch of assholes to them. And then Jaina had to do her little purge of Dalaran, which is completely, you know, that pushed the Blood Elves to, he's like, we should never trust the Alliance ever again, which is pretty reasonable after what Jaina did in Dalaran. And all this to say, Sylvanas is completely justified in what she did. Ooh, I remember this quest. This quest is a huge pain in the ass. I'm looking for a stealth person who can be anywhere inside here. I just gotta be super careful. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Basically, if you read the little short stories, Sylvanas explains a lot of this to Sourfang as well, as well as Gen Greymane's attack on them in Stormheim, where basically Gen disobeyed orders and decided to attack the Horde unprovoked and then hunted them down. And what did the Alliance do after, you know, that happened? They did nothing. They didn't reprimand Greymane. They didn't, you know, applaud what he did, but they didn't punish him either. And again, Greymane stayed as Anduin's right-hand man. And the fact that they didn't punish him for doing something like that is basically the same as endorsing it, even if they didn't do it officially. So the Alliance... You know, the Forsaken have all the reason in the world to think that they should, you know, conquer the Alliance. They don't really have a reason to make friends with them. Of course, we know, you know, since we're in the know with the Alliance, that they don't really want to fight the Horde right now because Anduin's all for peace. And that's one of the counterexamples people give. is like, you know, it was a different Alliance back then, and yet some of the Alliance members hold the Horde to Warcraft 1 and 2 standards hordes. And, like, even Sourfang agreed with Sylvanas' reasoning on it. And then, you know, Sylvanas is doing what she does. She, she goes a little too far. She burned the tree down, and Sourfang's like, you know what, that's going too far. I'm fine with normal warfare, but I'm not cool with killing people like this which is, you know, perfectly fine. Because, I mean, there's even the Geneva Conventions. There are some forms of warfare that, you know, even in real life, that people think is going too far. But then they're also trying to paint Sourfang's ideology, like he is in the right with the new quest lines in 7.1, where you have to find Sourfang where you escape from prison, and then you basically kill the people who were sent there to retrieve him. Because they tell him, you know, come back with us. Or, you know, die. And he's like, no, I'm not going to go back with you guys. And he's like, okay then, that's treason. And, you know, you have to fight them to save Sourfang. The thing is, um, that was treason. Like, Sourfang abandoned the Horde. And he was a political leader, so he has tons a very valuable knowledge, and Sylvanas' spies have confirmed that he was, you know, in talks with the Alliance. It is very reasonable for Sylvanas to assume, you know, someone who directly denied escape during the extraction scenario, and is willingly talking to the Alliance, that he's leaking secrets. Like, Sourfang is not 
in the right here even if he disagrees with what Alliance is doing but the narrative is trying to paint it as if Sourfang is the honorable face of the Horde and that maybe he'll be involved in restoring his vapid honor to everything else because they both ultimately have the same goal they want what's best you know for the Horde to an extent and Sylvanas is just willing to actually do the dirty work in order to get that goal done. And Sourfang's not willing to go that far, you know, which is understandable. I think that kind of is more of a, a morally gray thing. It's like, who is right in this situation? Obviously not, you know, the evil Sylvanas. But I don't think it's Sourfang either. But, you know, you know, I'm kind of curious to see how they do this. You know, th those are my thoughts on it. I'm not going to make a video about it, even though I just I have it all written out. Uh, but, you know, I'm not really happy with Sourfang being the face of the good of the Horde. Because, I mean, he's not really. But at the same time, he is. I do like Sourfang. I like his character. But I don't like how they're painting Sylvanas is obviously wrong. And Sourfang is obviously right. But, you know, I think it's a little bit more complicated. I'm going to have to see how the whole story unveils. But I don't like where it's going right now with them painting Sourfang in such a positive light. Uh, and at the same time, making Sylvanas more comically evil. Sylvanas cares about her people or doesn't, depending on who's writing her that day. She's. She's not the most consistent character in the world, I, I hate to say. As much as I do like to defend Sylvanas, they are kind of wishy-washy with her. Sometimes she really cares about her people in the Horde, and other times she thinks of them as like pawns to be used. And then there's times like in the... in Before the Storm where she kills her people who are coming back. And it's like, okay, Sylvanas, I mean, I get it. They were a council of people who were governing Undercity, so they're potential peoples of power who could overthrow you. But your reasoning for, like, when Sylvanas first found out about the Desolate Council, she wanted to kill them all immediately. And this just kind of gave her an excuse to do it. That's more of what it was, but I was expecting more from Sylvanas. That's all. Okay, so did I even really answer that question every after everything Savannah has done recently? Do you still consider yourself a Savannah supporter? Yes. Do you think of Thrall's Horde as something? Horde as the way to do things? Thrall's way is nice and everything. Savannah's way sees a lot more results, as she's shown. And the difference between her and Garrosh, because he was basically trying to do the same thing, is that Garrosh was an asshole to everyone, including other races of the Horde. He was more about orc supremacy. Whereas Sylvanas, she's a lot nicer to her allies. Even when Sourvang wanted, you know, to die at the Battle of Lordaeron, she was like, you know what? If you want to stay and fight to the death, do it. That's your own choice. When she was telling Bane to so subtly not to collude with the Alliance anymore. She's basically like, I know about the letters you're doing. You should probably stop. And he's like, okay. <laughs> he was, she's a lot less aggressive than Girash is about it. And she worked with Sourfang in order to organize the thing, the invasion of Ashenvale. She only changed plans at the very last second. And that's because Sourfang changed plans at the last second. She kind of had no choice in the matter. Well, not no choice. She definitely had a choice, and she chose to do something extreme, because that's what she does. Damn it! Did someone find her and kill her? Oof, this quest. This quest. I should make a video. Top 10 worst quests in the game. This will definitely be one of them. Like, I know I've been running around here this whole time looking for something, and that's because this is what you're supposed to do. This is the quest right here. You're supposed to just wander around until you find this assassin randomly. 
Uh, she's stealth and can spawn in many different places inside the keep or close to the walls outside the building. You need to search for her. Maybe I'm running too fast. They said outside the walls too. Whatever. It's not like I need to hurry up with this anyway. Ooh. She's, she sapped something. Maybe she's inside and I just missed her. Is she just like randomly killing things? Okay. Let's go on to the next one. I don't need to talk more about Sylvanas. She was totally in here killing things. How did I miss her? Uh, the BFA situation? Oh, talking about why people are mad about BFA? I don't know if I want to get into that. I just went on a huge tangent about Sylvanas and Sourfang. Do I really want to talk about Azerite gear? No, not really. Let's see. You said you don't like streaming, but you do like to watch streams. What game slash thing? Also, what was the most fun you've ever had on WoW? Leveling up characters didn't affect you. In my opinion, I'd like you to keep this way. Oh, cool. Well, I'm leveling up a character right now. Hmm. So that's two questions. First one. You said you like to watch streams. What game slash thing? I generally just watch streams of other YouTubers that I like. Uh, so the ones I watch the most are like Hard Leg Gaming. He's a Yu-Gi-Oh! YouTuber. And he just plays lots of other different games. So whatever he's playing. So I like to talk to his chat and then donate to play Despacito 3 on a stream because that's funny. And because he hates it. And then I'll sometimes watch Nora's stream from time to time. And Kakyo whenever he streams once in a blue moon. And those are the ones I watch the most. Otherwise, you know, I like to watch YouTube videos more than streams, but I have been watching a lot of streams because I've just been watching that one a lot in particular. Also, what was the most fun you've ever had on WoW? Definitely playing the auction house back in Cataclysm. That was a lot of fun. I kind of want to get back into that again so I can get the 5,000, no, the 5 million gold mount. And leveling didn't affect the stream very much. Well, the Q&A very much. Well, that's nice to know. Oh, God, this quest. What I should do is get a target macro for this. It's called the Kaldori Assassin. Macros. Kaldori Assassin. And let's just hope I didn't spell that wrong. I might have along the walls as well. Okay, so I answered those two questions. On to the next one. Haha, ha, when you speak about not trying new things, that's me sometimes. Someone will say, have you seen these new shows on Netflix? You should watch it, so good. And my reply is always, nah, I don't really have time to sit around and watch them all. And then I go home and rewatch whole Seinfeld series three times. I don't remember. Last time I made this stream, I might have talked about my policy on like rewatching things, on how time spent rewatching something is time that could be spent watching something new. You know, I don't have an unlimited amount of time to watch series, so got to make the most of it. Uh, I think I also talked about how sometimes people don't try new things because they're afraid of change, like they have some kind of anxiety about it. And it's a pretty common one where people just watch The Office like for the seventh time rather than try a new show because they're comfortable with The Office. Watching it, you know, they already know what's going to happen. They don't have to feel so invested. Oh, I found her. You know, I bet so many of you thought I was just wandering around being stupid like I didn't know what I was doing. You know, because I was wandering around for like 10 minutes, but no, this is just the quest. <laughs> this is how you do it. <laughs> this quest is just terrible. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't think I really need to expand on that. I don't really, I, I watch new stuff all the time. But, you know, sometimes, you know, if I'm in a bad place, I'll just rewatch a comedy series that I've already watched before, because it'll calm me down, make me feel... You know, like there's order in the world, and there's more cheer to life, and that things aren't terrible. As you know, life is just full of disappointment and bad things happening. So you don't need to be reminded about that in the forms of media you watch, too. Sometimes it's nice just to watch something that makes you laugh. 
Remember that there's more good in the world than there is bad, even if it doesn't seem like it. Let's see. Um, how many characters do you have? It seems like you use a lot of different ones for videos. Edit, forgot to add. Somewhere in the video you talked about how you thought worrying all the time about stuff was normal. That's so true. For years I thought it was completely normal to worry about stuff all the time, but realized it wasn't normal after getting diagnosed with uh, general anxiety and depression. Okay, so it seems like two questions. How many characters do you have? 50. I always have to delete a new character whenever I want to make a new one. Because the character cap is 50. So that's an easy one to answer. Yeah, I use different characters all the time. That's because I have a ton of characters. I'm definitely going to get stuck right here. Oh. Oh, I don't think I'm supposed to be over here. Oh no. Oh no, I think I'm stuck. Uh oh. Can I get out? I think I should be able to. It seems like a very easy place to get stuck. Blizzard's usually good about adding ways to get out of these kinds of places. Nope, looks like I just went down further. Okay, I'm just gonna hearthstone. Um, how many characters do I play, you know, like the most, I guess? I have my main priest and then a whole bunch of alts. None of them are also at 120 because the new expansion just started. I have been thinking about making a new alt. I want to make either a monk or a druid because I want a new character in my account on the server so I can have another max level character for professions. And for professions, I'm going to need reps. So it has to be a character that I'm going to do a lot of world quest on. You know, to grind out those reps, I can get the, the recipes. And if I'm going to do that, I want to play a character, you know, that could potentially, you know, be an alt for raids or something. Or to run dungeons with. So the only requirement is basically that I want um, a class I can heal. And I already have my priest. And I have a paladin, but I don't like paladins. They're just not very fun for me. Because I tried it out last expansion, and I didn't have a lot of fun with it. I, like, I even tried it out in raids and everything, too. And I was like, this isn't... I miss my priest whenever I'm healing on my paladin. <laughs> and I don't like melee characters. And ret melee for doing world quests wasn't fun. And prot was fun enough, but it didn't hit hard enough. And I was like, man, I wish, you know, this was the damage spec. Okay, can I fly over there? So I was thinking about trying, you know, one of the other three healing classes. No, I can't. So that leaves shamans, monks, or druids. And I don't really want to play a shaman because I have, you know, like a near max level shaman on my other account. And it's not very fun. I like to take it into battlegrounds and knock people off with thunderstorm, but I don't like either of its damage specs. Despite the fact that whenever I play a new game, I like to play the lightning class. And shamans are the only lightning class, but they are not fun to play. They, I don't know what it is about them. I try to like shamans so much, I just don't. So that leaves monks or druids. And it's like, I don't really want another melee class. So I'm leaning towards Druid because I can at least go balance, you know, for range. But a monk seems fun, and monks do have Jade Crackling Lightning, which is a super cool looking ability. So I'm thinking about one of those two, but I haven't decided yet. And what was the other question? Worrying about, oh, yeah, I have General Anxiety Disorder. Uh... And I used to think just worrying all the time was normal, so I didn't really think about it. And it just got a lot worse after I burned out from overwork and health-related problems. Which I was actually surprised. When I had my bleeding problem a couple weeks ago, I was surprisingly not freaked out about it. Like I was the last time I had a health problem. Uh, I was able, like I've been working at uh, constantly working at keeping my anxiety in check. So when something like that did happen, I didn't completely freak out and have a panic attack. And I kept everything relatively under control, and I was actually just kind of surprised. I was like, I thought I would worry more about this. You know, considering the fact that this, you know, terrible medical problem just happened to me, and I have to go to the emergency room, 
and I don't have health insurance. You know, this is this would be an understandable point to worry about. But I didn't. Who do I talk to? It says talk to Volgra to fly where? Why is there nothing on the map? Stupid Zygor. You're supposed to tell me where to go. I think I'm just supposed to go to the nearest uh, flight point. Anyways, I don't I don't need to get into general anxiety again. Unless someone else has a question about it, then I'll go into more details. Um, have you watched Gintama? It is my favorite series, more or less. Highly recommend you try it out. And if you got turned off by the first few episodes, just keep going. Sadly, the anime slash manga has a slow start and does not get interesting until around after episode after 30 episodes it is mainly a comedy series with some serious arcs mixed in the first of those arcs actually happen after around 55 episodes and that's what got me hooked into the series okay now gintama i have stories about gintama so for those of you who don't know if you go onto like any anime rating site where the community rates animes out of score of like you know whatever the score is Gintama, like all seasons of it, will always be in the top 10. People love Gintama. It is a very highly rated show. And generally, I agree with some of those high ratings, because they always put Steins Gate, or Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, or even Hunter x Hunter, or One Punch Man in the top 10. And those are all, you know, A-plus shows that totally deserve those spots. And then there's Gintama. I've tried to watch Gintama because of how popular it is and how well rated it is and it's just not for me which is sad because i love comedy shows those that is my favorite genre i like can't watch enough of comedy shows if i find a new comedy anime i'm gonna watch the entire thing i've basically watched all of them before <coughs> except gintama and not through a lack of trying mind you I have watched Gintama, and I'm on episode 150. And after watching 150 episodes of the series, I still don't like it. And you can't say I did not give it a fair chance. That is way more time than I'm willing to give any other show. And, you know, still not really been to it, because Gintama has like over 500 episodes or something. And after 150 episodes, it's still mediocre uh, I don't know whenever the new anime season ends I'll usually watch Gintama you know to try it out again like recently this anime season ended so I was like time to start up you know Gintama again I guess Zomgar stand Zomgar outpost well, I hope I am flying to the right thing and I tried it again, and the couple episodes I watched this time around, they were fine. They were actually kind of funny. Like, I don't hate all of it, that's why I was able to watch 150 episodes, but nothing about it really tells me why it's rated so highly, because there are so many, like, Japanese-centric references that you can't get unless you live in Japan and have consumed all kinds of Japanese literature and culture. Because they just, they reference the nichest things, and it's all Japanese-related. And I am someone who has been watching anime uh, extensively for, like, the past, I don't know, since 2011 or something. And casually before then. And even with all the anime I've watched, and all the Japanese culture I know, there is just no way to get all those references. There's too many of them, and they're all so niche. And that's most of Gintama's humor is incredibly niche Japanese callbacks to s stuff. So I just straight up don't get half the jokes. And sometimes they'll harp on a joke for like five minutes. And I was like, oh, that wasn't funny the first time. And you know, they just keep going on it over and over. Or sometimes they'll have entire arcs based on jokes. And I was like, that joke isn't funny. I don't want to watch three episodes about it. <laughs> And that's just my experience with Gintama. It's really hit and miss. I, I have enjoyed some of the episodes. But the main problems I have is it's more miss than hit with me. And I do not enjoy the art style. But that's because at under, episode 150, it's still in 
you know, square screen for three. Uh, it's still old quality from like 2006. And I might like it more once the upgrade it to, you know, widescreen. And it's actually in 720p instead of 480. Uh, just because, you know, the first couple of seasons are old. Because they were, Gintama's been airing for so long. And I think I'll probably like it once it actually gets to the new stuff. Uh, but as it stands now, I'm still trying to watch it. And I've been trying to watch it for like three to four years now. And I'm in no hurry to finish it. Because, yeah. But I am aware of Gintama. And that is the only show that I've been trying to watch for as long as I have, and only because it is so highly rated. Because, I mean, take Hunter x Hunter, for example. The best arc in Hunter x Hunter is the Chimera Ant arc, which is the last arc of the series. You know, the 2011 anime, anyway. And it doesn't start until, like, around episode 80. Uh, so I was like, you know... I would highly recommend watching all of Hunter x Hunter just to watch that one arc. Because it's just that good. It's possibly, like, my second favorite story I've ever read. You know, behind Spirit Circle, which is just nothing top Spirit Circle. That's so good. Spirit Circle is literally a masterpiece. And the thing is, though, with Hunter x Hunter, even though it's the fifth arc of the series, the first four arcs are all really good. Its second arc is also an A-plus arc that people hail as like one of the greatest of all time. So it is just a quality show all the way through. Like, of the five arcs of the anime, two of them are, you know, A-plus, masterpiece class, and the other three are just above average, which is still good. Gintama! I would be happy if it was just average all the way through, but it's just bad most of the time. Which is so, it's like, ugh. But, you know, what if it does get better? What if they have the Chimera Ant Arc level thing in there? You never know until you try it all the way. And it is so highly rated, alongside a whole bunch of other shows I've enjoyed. And I can see hints of a good show in there. So I'm still kind of giving it a shot, but I'm not really in a hurry. Okay, so that's... This is really long. I'm already an hour in. I've only answered like three questions. Let's see. I love your videos, even if I don't play WoW or Yu-Gi-Oh! Anyway, since you have a partition taste in anime, who is the best Konosuba girl? Can be either main girls or secondary, or both? Oh, that's easy. It's Megumi. Anyone who says anything else is a liar. Megumi. Aqua's pretty great too, though. Darkness is a garbage character. She's funny enough for the show, but when you have Megumi, who's like top class, and then Aqua, who's also just a hilarious gag character, Darkness is just too one note for that. And the other secondary characters, they hardly ever get any kind of... Man, look how slow 60% is. Whoa. <laughs> I'm still surprised, especially because Torrens are big. Get 20 Wrath Heads, kill... Oh, okay, I gotta kill Nagas around here. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. So, I watched all your videos. How unusual for you to hear. True. I have I do build my videos to be binge-watched, so there's lots of people who discover the channel and then watch all of them. Which is... I thank you for that. That's why YouTube suggests my videos so much, because I get so many evergreen views. Including these, and never thought you'd need to questions to answer. So, in that case, my question will be, why do you use Zygor guides instead of Doogie's guides? Have you tried the last one? In my opinion, Doogie's are way better for actual leveling, and the other thing, there is an add-on called Dialogue Key. It's just the best as a supplement for those guides as it fixes one of the few problems where they can accept and turn in single dialogue windows, but when NPCs give you two or more lines to choose, i.e. two quests, or one accept and one turn in, you have to manually drag your mouse and click them. And it's not only that, but basically every dialogue will be speeded up. Um, the reason I use Zygor over Doogies uh, is because I've tried out the free version of Doogie, and it's okay. I haven't tried the premium version of it. I know there's one that exists similar to Zygor. I just never have tried it out yet. 
and Zygor, it has its problems, but they're pretty minor. It's generally very good and worth the monthly subscription for me, considering how much I use it. You know, like, Zygor right here has been telling me everything I need to know for these quests. That's why I'm able to do all these quests while, you know, talking. Because Zygor just tells me what to do. Doogie, I've heard the premium version basically does the same thing. I haven't tried it. The free version of Doogie, it's not better than Zygor. Just straight up. But I know there's another one that exists. Also, with the quest add-ons to auto-turning quests faster, I don't really like those. Uh, but I also have another add-on here, let me kill this thing right here, called Leatrix Plus, which basically solves the problems you're talking about with speeding up the dialogue and, you know, auto-accepting faster and everything. I don't really care about that too much. In fact, I most of the time have auto quests turned off, and I just do it all manually anyway. Like, I have it on for this video, so I don't want to have to think too much. Uh, but if there's ever multiple dialogue choices, Zygor just tells me which one to pick. You know, because sometimes quests will have, you know, like, little quizzes on them and everything. And Zygor will be like, here's exactly what you need to do for this little puzzle. And I was like, thank you. Or it's one of those auto add-ons. I don't think they would do that. Because if Zygor doesn't do that, then they probably don't. They just, you know, allow you to go through dialogue faster if there was no options. Oops, did not mean to attack this. I would love an AoE. That would be very convenient. Okay, so next one. Uh, do you read slash watch JoJo? And if so, what is your favorite part JoJo? Joe Bro, Stand, and Villain. Mine is part four, Girono, Shiza, Killer Queen, and Kira. Hmm. My favorite part is also probably part four. I have read JoJo all the way up until halfway through part six. Uh, yeah, favorite part is probably part four. My favorite JoJo, I guess, would be second JoJo. Because he was hilarious. My favorite stand would probably have to be, uh, the author dude, the manga artist. What is his name? I'm blanking on his name right now, but Heaven's Door. Because that stand in JoJo, it has the ability to do anything. <laughs> it's it's so overpowered that there's a reason they didn't include him in too many fights. <laughs> because he could just write in, like, you know how to speak Chinese. And you know how to speak Chinese now. It's just It just works. Or if you write in, you now live on the moon. Well, guess who lives on the moon now? You do. Oh, you also know how to breathe on the moon. Yep, you just do. Whatever you write into the stand just happens. It is like the ultimate reality warping power. And that's the thing with JoJo. The guy who makes the stand abilities, he just kind of makes whatever the hell he wants. And then he'll sometimes realize, oh shit, I made this too overpowered. I'd better not include this character in the story too much. <laughs> kind of like what happened in part 5, where he introduced a character with a stand that had a gas that instantly killed anything it touched. He's like, you know what, this is too strong of a power. I'm going to have to have him exit the story. And so he did. And I don't really like part five very much. My favorite villain is also Kira from part four. A lot of these things are from part four. Because Heaven's Door was also a part four ability. I really like Kira. He's, he's a great villain. Especially since his whole ideology is he just wanted to be a normal person. And he strived for normalcy, and I was like, I, I hate to say that I relate to that. <laughs> I love the normal things, but you know, not to the extent he did. That guy is fucking crazy. But that's probably what also makes him a really good villain is probably his relatableness. I someone made a video on it explaining why people like Kira so much, and I was like, I I understand this. He's still like a evil serial killer so there's no that was also a problem the guy who made the series said he said he made Kira too likable and he didn't want people to like Kira because he was a serial killer 
you know, you shouldn't feel anything, anything positive towards a serial killer. And I was like, yeah, that's fair. You shouldn't. But, you know, you went and made him likable anyway. And I guess that's why he tried to make him more evil as the series progressed. Um, let's see. I think I answered everything. Joe Bro stand. Question. What is your most proud slash happy moment in WoW? I have no clue if you already got this answer. Perhaps more football stories? My most happy slash proud moment in WoW? Oh, it was probably when we got Spine of Deathwing down both times. Because back in Cataclysm, I raided in two raid teams. And both of those raid teams were two of the best raids on the server. So on my healer's raid team, we were progressing on Heroic Spine of Deathwing. And I don't know if you guys know this, but Spine of Deathwing was the only time in WoW where the second to last boss... No, not the only time. There was a couple of times in Vanilla and BC too. One of the few times in WoW where the second to last boss was harder than the last boss. And Spine of Deathwing was just like a monster of a boss fight. That's There was so much wrong with it. To the fact that Blizzard kind of uses it as an example of what not to do when designing boss fights. Anyways, I we were having a tough time on Spine of Deathwing because it was a really hard fight. And I thought, you know, I have all of these raid-ready alts. What if I just swap to my Raid Finder geared Shaman alt and we try doing this, despite the fact that it's heroic mode and heroic back then was, you know, mythic mode today. So it was the hardest form of content. I was like, going into mythic mode with LFR gear? That's crazy. But the thing is, the Spirit Link totem made the fight so much easier because there was a healing mechanic on the fight where he would periodically put out like bubble debuffs on people and hold up I don't like how this is saying I failed there we go and the healing debuff on people was basically like it absorbed 500,000 healing and then once it absorbed that much then you could start getting healed and there was a lot of ray damage on the fight so you had to constantly heal people to get this bubble off of them and so it was a super healing intensive fight because everyone was always taking damage, and they always had a little debuff on them that absorbed 500,000 healing, which is a ton. Uh, and what Spirit Link Totem did was it would equalize everyone's health, and the way it did that was by damaging players and healing others instantly. So, if a couple of people were really low on health, and a couple of people were really high on health, it would equalize everyone's health, you know, like redistribute the wealth, which would instantly heal people past the threshold for the healing absorb debuff and just completely wipe it. It was the only raid cooldown in the game that could just instantly wipe off that debuff. So you didn't have to worry about it. You could just let everyone stack up the debuff as much as you wanted and then when we needed to heal everyone, we'd have everyone stack up, pop Spirit Link Totem, and it would just wipe the debuff off of everyone and then we could heal them. And then just wait until it happened again. And the thing is, we had one Shaman in the raid group, but Spirit Link Totem had a cooldown on it, so we couldn't do it all the time. So with a second Shaman, we were literally able just to rotate them, and we got the kill within five attempts. Because it was just that helpful. And then, on my uh, Hunter's raid group, because we were also progressing on Spine of Deathwing, um, I think we had two Shamans. Someone else had a shaman alt, so we were able to do that, but we had problems with the burst damage because another mechanic of the fight was there was no boss to fight on the Spine of Deathwing. You were basically trying to burst damage these tendrils that you had to pop. You had to kill three tendons, and once you killed those three, you won the fight. And that's all it was, was building around popping the plate so that you could have a chance at DPSing down those tendrils, or tendons or whatever. And the tendons would only exist for 20 seconds. So you only had a 20 second window to actually do any damage to the one thing that would allow you to win the fight. So the fight heavily incentivized burst damage over everything else. And my hunter, none of the three specs had burst damage, like on this scale uh, that some other classes did. So I swapped over to my arcane mage. 
who had the best burst damage in the game. And once I swapped over to my arcane mage, we got the kill within like five attempts because we finally had the burst damage needed to just take it down. And that was like some of the most fun I had because, you know, literally swaps I made allowed us to get first kills on the hardest boss in the game. I was like, ooh, I'm just too good at this game. And I'll always remember those, and that's why I always tell those stories whenever I can in videos. Because Bind a Deathwing, with how unique the fight was, it comes up a lot. <laughs> Target is not on the ground. I can't use that while I'm not on the ground. Okay. Um, question. How excited are you? Question. How excited are you for the anime of JoJo Part 5? Considering I wasn't the biggest fan of Part 5, not at all. It has started, though. I've read Part 5, and boy, can I complain about it. There's I just... Shut up, Siri. I forgot what I was talking about. I think I was talking about Garbage JoJo. Oh, Part 5? Yeah. Sounds about right. There's a reason I stopped reading JoJo in the middle of Part 6. It's. I hear Part 7 is like the best JoJo, but if I have to get through Part 6 to get to 7, no thanks. I'll just take their word for it. I'm drowning. Okay, I need the barnacle encrusted gem. There we go. I'll just complete this quest real quick. Hopefully it doesn't take away my costume. Yes. It's great. Costume goes away if I get in combat though. Okay. Um Ooh, this next one's really long. Good thing I have water breathing right now. Ugh. I like your Yu-Gi-Oh! Top 10 list because they talk about cards I know about and some I've never heard of, considering how many there are in the game now. So keep making them on a more monthly basis because your replays are far more fun to watch. Yeah, that was before I basically transitioned to one or two Top 10s a week. You can tell this comment was made two months ago. Uh, so question number one, have you ever been bitten by a dog? I have once and had to quit internship because of that and three days later ended up with bell palsies. Not a fun thing to have, half your face paralyzed for months and not being able to blink normally all the while. Eesh, that sucks. Uh, I have been bitten by a dog, my own dog, and that was a couple of years ago. I, I still have uh, scars on my stomach from that particular attack. I think they've healed up mostly. I'm trying to look right now and I can't really see. I do notice that I have some new stretch marks, though. <laughs> uh, note to self, for those of you who don't know, weightlifting gives you stretch marks. Just in case you didn't know that. Um, but yeah, no, the reason I was going numb is because of anxiety. I, it wasn't something else, like other people were suggesting. Shit, I forgot about my costume. I didn't want to lose it. Let's see, uh, next question. Would it be okay to tag or DM you on Discord if I see you're not doing anything on Hard Lake Server? Just curious to know, I probably won't ever unless I feel like you're asking a couple of questions that aren't comment section safe. Uh, please don't DM me on Discord. Like, if you had asked me two months ago, I'd probably say, yeah, sure. You know, go for it and I'll answer you when I can. But I've been having some really bad experiences with Discord PMs in particular lately. To the point where I'm just ignoring everything now. Cause it's like, man, do I not want people... Oh, an elite shark. I gotta be careful. I, I probably won't get into it right now. But... Yeah, I don't answer them anymore. And I was considering just putting myself as like permanently offline. You know, that way... Uh, I wouldn't feel bad for ignoring people's messages. And then I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. If anything, that gives me more incentive to stay with the online status whenever I can. You know, if I'm going to put myself as online because I want to hide from people, you know, that, that means they win. I don't want them to win. I want me to win. So I'm just going to keep doing whatever the hell I want. And I'm just, you know, not going to respond to messages anymore because people are crazy not not all of you just you know enough people where I, I'm not replying to messages on discord anymore 
Feel free to send me messages through my Facebook page, though. I generally reply to all of those. You know, unless you're like a spam bot or trying to get me to sponsor. If you want to sponsor me for your boosting website, no, I'm not. I'm not going to advertise your boosting services or your gold selling websites. No matter how many times a day you guys message me. Um, number three. If you were paid to do a face reveal, how much would it be? Why, under what set of circumstances, would you do it? I mean, money isn't really the issue for a face reveal. It's more of a privacy thing. Like, you know, online people can be scary. And there's no reason for me to show my face for the kinds of videos I make. Uh, and also, I mean, you don't really want to see my face anyway. You know, you would just be very disappointed. But if you go to BlizzCon, you can probably see me and be disappointed in person. But there's no reason for me to show my face online. You know, but if you were to ask for like a monetary value, I don't know. If you paid me a lot of money, I'd probably do it. Because, I mean, who wouldn't do something that easy for a ton of money? But, like, it's just not something... I really have to do for my channel, so I'd rather not do it. And also, why do you guys want to see what I look like so bad? If you type in my name in Google, that is the first thing that pops up. You know, like Haruma Red X, and the first autocomplete is face reveal. If you want to know what I look like, uh, there's this YouTuber called Tips Out. He makes cl classic WoW videos. I recently watched a whole bunch of them, and I was like, oh, these are these are neat. He shows a lot of things about vanilla WoW. It's like, oh, these are nice fact videos. He is uh, very positive about vanilla WoW, though, to the point where it's basically propaganda. Like, he'll talk about vanilla WoW to the point where, like, there is literally nothing wrong with anything ever in vanilla WoW. And I was like, you know, these are discussion videos. He makes good points, but he leaves no room for discussion about anything negative. And that is a tiny bit off-putting, but not enough where I wouldn't suggest his videos. I absolutely do recommend his videos. They're good. But also, if you want to know what I look like, I basically look like Tips Out. That's a good indication. It's almost like we're, we're doppelgangers. Um, question four. Hypothetically speaking, if you switched your whole channel's direction away from general WoW content to make nothing but top 10 list every week or two, would you buy your own house or a dedicated studio with the ad money? I mean, seeing as making videos is pretty much a full-time job now, it makes sense wanting to have a separate between working and not. Um, the thing is, the house I live in now already has two empty bedrooms. Like, I can just move into one of those if I want an office. And I did do that at one point. And then I had new neighbors move in, and they had dogs that liked to bark at random times. And I realized at that point that my room, the one I'm currently sleeping in, is the only one that's completely soundproof. Because, like, the other rooms in the house, uh, like, all the neighbors have dogs. And dogs being dogs, they'll just bark randomly sometimes. You know, it's not a problem where they bark constantly all the time. It's just, you know, sometimes, I don't know, they'll, a bird will fly into the backyard, so they have to bark at it for five minutes. Just stuff like that, and that just ruins recording sometimes, or I have to sit there and wait for them to stop. While I was in the room I'm in, the dogs, the neighbor's dogs can bark all they want, and I'll never hear them. So I basically just do everything in this room because it's the most soundproof one. And it just also happens to be the one I sleep in as well. But if I want a studio for my work stuff, I... I can have one, because there's two empty rooms. One of them's kind of like a quasi-workout room, with like a treadmill and stuff I bought in there that I don't use, mainly because I can't run anymore. When I go into the gym, I did low-impact cardio stuff, because I can't run anymore, because it hurts my chest. My chest hasn't been hurting for a long time, though. That was, a, you know, small little victories. I had the little bleeding incident, but at least my chest isn't hurting anymore right now. I'm going to keep it that way. Also, if I did nothing but top tens every two weeks, would I be able to buy my own house? I can buy my own house now. You know, not 
pay for it with cash, but you know, get a mortgage and be like, this is how much I make every month. I could easily afford one, but why would I want to do that? I don't really like the idea of having a permanent residence. I like the fact that I can just move out whenever I want. It's like, what if I want to move to a different state or something? It'd be a lot harder if I owned my own house. I'd have to like sell it first and deal with a bunch of annoying shit like that. The fact that I just rent this one for my mom, it's like I could just move out whenever I want. And it's a very convenient location. It's a big house. It's in a nice neighborhood. Uh, I'm good where I'm at right now. And I like the fact that I can just move whenever I want. Let's see. Um, highly edited. I mean, he's pretty much full time now, and since separation between working and not. Question five: Are you above the clickbait memes because you make highly edited videos that are easily bingeable? Also, don't you think that Wow News, while a failed series by algorithm standards, brought new visitors to your channel and cautious, consciously didn't subscribe because the type of content is easily accessible on other channels slash platforms? But took a look through your catalog and made a mental note for it if they ever wanted to know more about the lore of the game. Okay, so that's a that's two questions, I think. Are you above the clickbait memes? No, not really. I use clickbait. Like whenever I talk about thumbnail design. Cause for those of you who don't know, let me check how much time's left in this so far. Shit, an hour and a half? God damn it. I can talk forever. Um, for those of you who don't know. The most important thing about your video is its title and thumbnail. The video itself, you know, if that's good too, that's fine. But the most important things for getting people to watch the video is the title and thumbnail. So you need to spend the most amount of effort on those. And if you don't clickbait, you're at a disadvantage over everyone else who doesn't have their heads up their asses and actually, you know, make smart business decisions. I mean, you don't need to really put any effort in your thumbnails. I mean, Noble87, the most subscribed to WoW YouTuber, uh, has the most basic thumbnails possible. And look how well he's doing. So, I mean, there's examples of people who don't need to do it. But having a good thumbnail absolutely helps your video. And the more clickbaity, the better. But also, if you go too clickbaity, you're going to have a negative stigma on your channel, so you need to find a proper balance. Because all the other WoW YouTubers, besides Noble, uh, clickbait to an extent. And they do it well enough where you don't even really notice it half the time, like Talius and Evatel clickbait, uh, Bellier clickbaits, Pyro clickbaits, Nixium clickbaits, Crendor clickbaits, they all do it to an extent. But none of them like so heavy handed that you think, man, what a stupid clickbait channel. Uh, and then you have someone like Vaulty who clickbaits all the way. And honestly, when I talk about people with good thumbnails, I like to use Vaulty as like the best example. He has the best thumbnails out of all of the WoW YouTubers. Uh, because if you want to measure success by people who click on a video purely because of the thumbnail, Vaulty is number one, without a doubt. Probably because his are the most clickbaity. And, I mean, people use clickbait as a negative connotation because originally clickbait meant, you know, you have a title and then the video has nothing to do about it. Or if you have, like, a girl with big tits and then you have an arrow pointing at them and the video is about, you know, like, top ten kinds of dog shampoos, you know, that's clickbait by the traditional trend definition of the word. But the definition has changed over time, like most words do, to incorporate any kind of enticing thumbnail. Uh, Vaulty, he doesn't do the old traditional clickbait where, you know, the thumbnail has literally nothing to do with the channel, with the video. He does it where the thumbnail is absolutely what his channel video is about. And it definitely gets you to want to watch it. So, he's definitely the most successful thumbnail maker on the WoW side of YouTube. But most people don't like to go that far. They usually like dial it down. They don't go to like one extreme where Vaulty has the most clickbaity thumbnails or to like Noble where he doesn't even attempt it. He did try for like a couple, for like a month or two and uh, 
I wouldn't say he tried to make clickbait thumbnails. He tried to put more effort into his thumbnails. And, well, he deleted those thumbnails. And I kind of wish I had pictures to show you what they look like. Uh, suffice to say, he doesn't try that anymore. Uh, but, no, I don't think I'm above clickbait. It's a smart business move to take that seriously. I have absolutely changed thumbnails on videos before, and they've gotten more views after I change the thumbnail. And I actually do it kind of regularly. I'll sometimes go back to an old video that's not performing well, change its thumbnail, and a couple weeks later it gets more views. Because YouTube loves to suggest my videos, and the better the thumbnail, the more chances are people will watch it. Um, hmm. And there was something else in there. Also, don't you think WoW News... Oh, okay. So after I moved WoW News to a new channel, people have been complimenting me on the increase in quality of my videos. It's like, man, I don't know what you're doing, but your videos have just been looking a lot better recently. And I was like, I'll have you know, I have literally changed nothing except move my uh, news videos to a different channel. So it looks like I've been doing nothing but quality. But that's just because you're only seeing my highly edited videos now. And that's the psychological aspect of it that I was trying to avoid by moving those to another channel. And I'm already seeing uh, positive results with it. Because if people look at your backlog and they see a bunch of videos they don't want to watch, they won't subscribe. And they don't see those anymore ever since I stopped posting the news videos on the channel. And precisely because of what you said, you know, you can get WoW news anywhere. so. That doesn't really entice people to subscribe to your channel. Even though some people like it, it's not that popular. Brazer, put it out to Vorsk. It won't be long before the Naga comes in. Oops. Oops, I did not mean to start a pet battle. I need to fight some Naga. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, that wasn't good. I didn't even see the thing on it. Damn it, I wish I had an AoE. Why don't I have Whirlwind yet? Stupid game. Okay. What was I talking about? Oh. Yeah, ever since I moved news videos to another channel, yeah, people think my quality's gone up when it hasn't. <laughs> uh, I just tricked you guys. You guys are all falling victim to normal psychology. Not even reverse psychology or anything. It's just, you know, straight up psychological stuff. Um, let's see. Thank you for addressing your health anxiety so openly. That really helps me feel so much less alone and crazy about my own. I happened to come into this video after a pretty big health anxiety freak out, and that part really, really calmed me down. Yeah, I actually had a couple of people send me messages talking about their own stories with anxiety. And how me talking about it. Like, someone said they were also having problems with being numb. And then when they heard my video, they're like, Oh, wow, I have been really anxious about stuff lately. I guess that's what it was. I was like, Oh, I'm glad you guys, you know, the fact that I was talking about it could help some of you. Because I just like to talk about myself. This is fun for me, making these Q&A videos. Because I'm a huge raging narcissist who has a giant ego. So I love to talk about everything about myself. But I also know that's not a very attractive character trait, and if you don't keep it in check, you'll just become insufferable. So, I try to do stuff like this sparingly. Is this the end of the quest? So the fact that I also accidentally helped some of you guys by just talking about my own struggles with anxiety, I'm glad that helps you guys. Is, is the quest done? Requires Zongmush Forge. Um, uh, am I supposed to come up here? Get Hydra Oil? Lighthouse Fire Lit? What the hell, Zygor? What am I supposed to do next? You expect me to figure things out on my own? Okay, so... There's only a handful of these questions left. I'm almost done. I'm going to try to like speed through them. So this isn't two hours long. 
Uh, any plans to do another top 10 lore characters at a different race? The Undead one is my favorite video of yours. Okay, so this is in reference to my video, Top 10 Undead Lore Characters. Uh, personally, one of my favorite top 10s I've ever made. Like, when I go back and watch it, I think, wow, this is a good video. And I rarely think about that anything. Whenever I make a video, I hate it afterwards, and I never want to see it ever again. And when I go back and watch my older stuff, I was like, God, this video's awful. Why didn't pass me put more effort into it? Except for that one. I think that's a great video, and it's one of my favorites. Missing Hydra Oil? Where do you get Hydra Oil at? Cooks 10, so I need to cook them at a brazier? Where is this brazier at? Is it inside the keep? Because I have 10 of these. Ugh, God damn it, Zygo, you're supposed to tell me these things. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, the Undead Lore video. Even though I liked the video, and it did well, the problem with the video is it took me a month to make. Like, straight up, I had to work on it part-time while I was working on other videos. Because the research for it was insane. I had to look up, like, literally every single major Undead Lore character that exists. And know everything about them all. And then narrow that down to 10. And then reread all of their lore and then narrow down everything about them. Is it right here? Requires the forge, which I think is in here. So I basically had to become a lore expert on 10 characters. And then I had to summarize their lore in a video that would fit in a top 10. And then I had to create the footage for it, and lore videos are some of the hardest videos to make. Because a lot of the stuff that happens in lore isn't in-game, or there's no footage for it. So you have to, like, kind of create your own footage. Or go out and complete incredibly long quest chains just to get one piece of footage. So the video itself was just a nightmare to make. And that's why I haven't done any more yet, but I do... I did tentatively have plans to work on a Blood Elf video. So I have kind of some research done for it, but I got so burned out from the Undead video that I just... It's on the back burner. I'd like to do another one, but the last one took so long to make that it, it kind of scares me to make another one. Okay, next question. Uh, Super fun... Shit, I fell. I should just... I probably shouldn't be running upstairs while I read the Q&A stuff. So instead, I'll read it and then run up the stairs. Super fun Q&A to watch, let's listen to. Question for your next video. You said you went to college. What degree do you have? Any interesting stories from your college days? I went to college for psychology and I didn't finish. I was very close to finishing. I could probably go back and get a degree. Not in psychology, but in something. If I just went back and finished Japanese. And I think that was it. That was like my only credit I needed left. I could probably get a, a degree with the credits I have now. But I hated Japanese so much and I just wanted to focus on YouTube and I'm having fun with YouTube right now and I really don't want to go back to school to finish it so I don't have a degree. But I did go to school for a long time and I have a crap ton of credits. I just don't want to have to deal with that again but I might sometime in the future. Just because I hate saying I dropped out. Because I was so close to finishing. I just, what the hell do I need a degree for? I have basically what would amount to a dream job right now. And I have two successful channels. That makes me want to work on a third one. How many people can say they have two successful channels? Of course there are lots of people who have one successful channel that's more successful than my two channels put together. But I mean, can you really... how would you even describe success on YouTube? Being able to pay all your bills with it? And then in that case, I have two successful channels. Even if a lot of the revenue from one channel goes to pay the editor. But even, you know, after paying the editor, I make a huge profit off the channel just because it does so well. Like, that's that's how great the Yu-Gi-Oh! channel is doing right now. Um, let's see... Any interesting stories from your college days? I do have lots of stories from college, but this Q&A is already kind of long. 
and I can't think of any ones that are short. So I'm just gonna have to. I'll come back to that. Um, let's see. What is the highest rank you've achieved in Hearthstone, and which class is your favorite? My highest rank is probably like rank ten or something. I I'm not like I play lots of card games, but I don't play any of them competitively. I only play card games to play gimmick decks and have fun with that. So I don't really ever try to climb rank. So I'd like to say, you know, I can get legend real easily if I just try, but I'm never going to try. And I don't like to say I can do things if I haven't done them, so... I've heard it's not that hard to climb rank to legend. You just have to play a meta deck and be consistent with it and play a crap ton of matches. And I don't ever plan on doing that. I'd much rather try to play one of the stupid gimmick decks I'm playing right now. And just play it until I get bored, <laughs> which is what I usually do. I'll usually get bored of a deck after winning a couple times in a row with it, and then I'll just make a new one. And also my favorite class usually alternates between Hunter or Priest. Which is funny because my mains in WoW were Hunter and Priest. It's, it's not that I chose those because of that, it's because you know some of the decks they have just happened to be ones that I liked. And I've been trying to get like a Gob Bomb deck to work recently. And those are the ones I've been playing a lot recently, because it's a uh, because let what we call it hunters have a legendary card that summons a whole bunch of gob bombs. And with priests, they have the Zeke's cloning machine. And I was having a lot of fun with that. And like a couple expansions ago in Hearthstone, I was playing Druid a lot. But like the Quest Druid deck, the one I like to play, they keep not giving it any support. It's like Blizzard wants to forget that Quest Druid exists, which is very sad. But Druid also has like four other of the best decks in the game and people keep saying that Druid is like, you know, one of the worst classes because everyone plays it. Because it has the most amount of good meta decks. But they don't have anything for my Quest Druid deck and I hate it. <laughs> it's like, I just want to play Quest Druid, I don't care about this other shit. And this Q&A was going so long that I had to go use the restroom real quick. Okay, there's like two more questions left. Nope, there's three. I'm gonna have to like power through these ones now. Okay, so sometimes when you bring out content, I'm not really into it. Dave and Devbot, fair. Lots of people don't like Dave and Devbot. I let it run in the background anyway, so you get the view time. By the way, I also used to watch your Q and A's to fall asleep. Your fake voice is very relaxing and calming. Yeah, I hear that a lot. Uh, now to the question. How can you like rain and snow? I mean, don't get me wrong, I live in Switzerland, it's pretty cold here all throughout the year and it rains almost every day. I have a job outside and I like it when it's warm and dry for once. See, that's the thing. You probably like it warm and dry because it's always rainy and snowy. And that's the same reason I like the rain and snow. is because it's always goddamn hot here every day. And the weather is only nice for like two weeks out of the year. And then it just gets slightly hot again. Although I do love the winters here. Like, even at its hottest, it's still not that bad. And then the summer, it's super goddamn hot, so you never want to be outside for more than a minute. And I would just love it if it rained. Whenever it rains in Arizona, uh, people love to flood their Facebooks and social media with pictures of the rain. Me included, because it's awesome. <laughs> Uh, let's see. What do you use to get updates on World of Warcraft lore and events besides the actual game? See, I have a WoW news channel, so I just, I look at other news sites, and I just compile all the information from that, and they always have, like, the newest WoW stuff immediately. So I usually find out stuff immediately as it happens, and where to get it all, because of the research for my WoW news channel. Uh, before I used to do that though, it was basically just whatever I found through Reddit or Blizzard Watch. They'd sometimes post lore snippets on the WoW subreddit. But currently the WoW subreddit is a cesspool of negativity, so I wouldn't suggest it. But Blizzard Watch is always good. I'd recommend them if you want a website to check every day. And they'll give you important news and go over nice little lore tidbits. Um, last question, finally. Oh, question. I am not a WoW player, but Strix me as repulsive that the Horde players have a slaughter story as this expansion quest. 
I mean, I'm a boxer for 10 years now, I like fighting aggression, but the story of the Horde sounds dishonorable. Nothing for me. Who plays Hordes? Rats, maybe? I think I kind of covered this point when I was going on my Sourfang rant. Uh, the Horde has every reason to do what it's doing. The problem lies with Sylvanas going too far most of the time. And like the morality behind necromancy. And it's like, is it wrong to raise people as undead when the leader of the horde isn't undead herself? Maybe. It's kind of a gray area. Like the mind control and everything. And is what Sourfang's doing actually honorable or not? Or is he just vapid with his convictions? And does he just change his mind whenever it feels suited to him? Because I'm sure he's killed plenty of people in battle behind the back, so why why is he like throwing the fit over doing it to Malfurion? Just because he's a major leader? Because he's a superpower? Because Malfurion is like a one-man squad. He can take on like 30 men on his own and kill them. Sourfang can't do that. But he has no problems like killing people through stealth in actual combat. And he's just kind of wishy-washy with what's honorable or not it's not consistent but there is kind of a it's an easy base to go by you know he's not super consistent with it but then again it's kind of loose anyway so you can't be all that consistent with it and Sylvanas isn't consistent either uh, her moods basically depend on who's riding her that day or if they need a new raid to happen you can't really take wild lore super seriously you kind of have to be more flexible with it because story, gameplay comes first, and story just kind of has to accommodate that. And I don't really like how people have such a circle jerk over, you know, Thrall's honorable horde when Sylvanas's horde is just as valid. But, you know, I also can't deny that she doesn't go too far most of the time. And she's kind of... She's kind of a little... No, I guess that kind of explains it pretty well. I don't really need to add more to it. She just goes too far sometimes. Okay. Um, I mean, just going too far sometimes could be a way to just dismiss, you know, really major things. It is like a... a completely fair, legitimate complaint about Sylvanas' character and why some people probably don't like her. It's not something that stops me from liking her though. If anything, that's part of the reason I like her character. It's because she's willing to do things like this in order to accomplish her goals. And it makes her more interesting to me. But I can also see why people who play as the Horde would just want it to be Thrall's way or Vulgen's way. Even though what Sylvanas is doing, I like where it's going. Okay, that's it for the Q&A. Because my dogs are going to start barking at something. Uh, if you have questions for the next Q&A, let me know in the comments, and I'll answer them in the next video. And you know what? Questing while I do in the Q&A seems to be working out so far. Especially that part where I was stuck looking for a spy for 10 minutes. <laughs>